I'll start. I'll start recording now, so no one knows how silly I am on the recording. I'll rename myself too, Doctor Scott. There you go. Now you know who I am. So, welcome to uh, a question and answer session with with Doctor Scott. Uh, that's me. And um, so I hope you all brought some questions and hopefully I'll try to answer them. And before we get started, we'll just chat in. Om Ekadantaya Vitmahe Vakrachundaya Dhimahi Tanudanti Prachodat. Om Ekadantaya Vitmahe Vakrachundaya Dhimahi Tanudanti Prachodat. Om Ekadantaya Vitmahe Vakrachundaya Dhimahi Tanudanti Prachodat. Awesome. So who has a first question? Do you know how to raise your hand? Do you know the raise your hand feature? Go ahead and raise your hand if you have a question, I'll call on you. It doesn't have to be about a course I'm teaching. You say, well, I read this Sanskrit word once. What does it mean? Or it can be, you know, what do you think of Pitta, Scott? <laughs> or whatever. So it can be a question about anything. And if I know, I'll tell you. And if I don't know, I, I'll say I don't know. But you all should sign up for that course I'm teaching uh, because I think that's why we're here is, is for marketing, to convince you to take this, this course that I'm teaching later on. Well, come on, who has a question? Let's go, you guys are already- I have one. Okay. iPhone, you have a question. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I thought my name was on here. It's me, Kenyatta. Um, yes, Hi, so Kenyatta. I was curious, hello. I was curious if um, this Sanskrit course, or not Sanskrit, but the yoga course, if it's similar to the yoga sutra one that you just taught. So uh, the, uh, oh, the, which, the yoga course I'm personally teaching? Yes. Yes, that's, uh, it's gonna be exact. Did you take the yoga sutra class I taught? Yes. It's the same one, so you don't have to take it again. Okay. Uh, and I'm, I'm a very bad salesman. <laughs> oh, you're welcome to take it again. It's the same. It's the same Yoga Sutras class I taught before. Uh, back in the Got it. Yes. Oh, is that Payam raising your hand? Hi, Payam. Uh, hello, Doctor Scott. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, I'd like to know about this course. Is this course actually is about psychology, Ayurvedic psychology, or neuropsychology, or uh, neurology? I don't know what so there is that about. At all, it's not my field, um, and so I'll take you through what this what I planned for the syllabus. I haven't actually made the course yet. I have to do that this month, but I'll, okay. I'll tell you what is planned for the course. Um, so we're going to start out doing three, four weeks of Vedic philosophy. So where 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 the idea of what the mind is. So the mind for Vedas isn't the physical structure. The physical structure just is a reflection of the mind. The mind is something that exists in the subtler bodies, okay? And so what we'll do is we'll look at the Shad, shad Darshana. The Shad means six, Darshana means witnessings and, uh, or, or lookings, and it's the six approaches to spirituality uh, that is classical in the Vedic tradition. And in looking at them, each of them has a slightly different idea of what the mind is and how the mind fits into their cosmology. Uh, because in, in Vedic science, uh, the spirit and mind come first, and then the physical body comes second, which is a different point of view from uh, most what are called materialists. Uh, and, and scientists, many scientists are also materialists, and they say that first comes the physical structure and then comes the subtler structure of consciousness in the mind. Okay, so we're not materialists at all in Vedic culture. We think the mind comes first, spirit comes first, consciousness comes first, and then the physical structures come later. Um, and, and the materialists say just the other way, both, by the way, are faith positions. Uh, you can't really prove either one. 
Um, the, but the Vedic scientists came to their conclusions through meditating. That's how they got there. They meditated, they became one, they witnessed things in meditation and that's where they came to their conclusions. And scientists came to their conclusions by poking things and breaking things down. But what scientists don't often realize is that their position is also a faith position because I can, I, I can ask a scientist, Sci Mr. Scientist, knock, 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 can you show me which neuron is creating the consciousness? Point to it. Can you point to it? Tell me which collections of neurons creates the consciousness. Can you say, tell me the five or the 10 or the 100? Which 100 are creating the consciousness? They can't, right? It's just a faith position as well. Um, and so um, I don't know why my front door is rigging. I apologize. Um, Natalia, where are you? It looks so beautiful. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. I, the storm is ringing, and it's, I am the, in it's the stove repairman. And Natalia, you can tell us where you are because you are so beautiful. I mean, you're where you are at is so beautiful. I mean, you're. Oh goodness. I am. I am in Cancun. Oh wow, you're in Cancun, Mexico now. <laughs> beautiful. Yeah, it's so beautiful here. It's so nice. <laughs> okay, so I was in the middle of waxing poetic on, on materialism <laughs> and whatnot. Anyway, so the first four weeks of the course, we'll look at these six systems of Indian philosophy. So we'll spend a day on Sankhya, which is the probably one of the most important. Then we'll spend a day on Yoga Sutras, which is also most important. Okay, because we'll get around what yoga and the mind, how yoga approaches the mind. And then we'll look at Vedanta, and how Vedanta constructs the mind. Uh, and we'll look at the Panchakosha theory, which is these sheets, how we exist in these sheets of many bodies. And then we'll look at the minor three, the minor three. They're called, I don't, I don't know why I call them the minor three, but uh, when you're in the yoga world, you don't really look at Mimamsa, which is about rituals and how ritual works in the mind or about Nyaya, about logic and the mind. And we'll look at Vaisheshika, um, who, whose big kind of talking point is what we take into our body affects our mind. Whoa. You know, and so we'll learn things like that um, and how that, how that works and how those effects happen and, and their basic way of constructing uh, reality. Because in looking at the mind, you have to know well, where does the mind come from? And if we were in a neuroscientist class, well, we'd start the other way. We'd look at the neurons and the myelin sheaths and the gray matter and the, the white matter, and we'd build up from there. But instead, we're coming from the Vedic point of view. So we're going to look at these systems of philosophies that were handed down from these great meditators and, and, and get their understanding of how the mind works. And once we have that understanding of how the mind works, uh, then we'll, we'll, we'll plunge into an application of Sankhya, uh, Sattva, Rajas, and Tamas, and those Mahagunas. And we'll classify food. We'll have a little workshop on classifying food. Then we'll look a little bit into Ayurvedic psychiatry uh, called Graha Chikitsa. We'll look at chakras and how chakras might affect the mind or how chakras might be the mind. And we'll uh, look at mantras and see how mantras might affect the mind. Then uh, we'll look at some brain herbs. It's Ayurveda and the mind kind of. And I'll take you through two days of just looking at some of the Ayurvedic formulations, uh, not just plain herbs, but I'll look at some of those too, but we'll also look to Ayurvedic formulations uh, that people use like uh, one of the best things for schizophrenia is an Ayurvedic compilation or formulation called uh, Panchagavya Gritam. You're like, what? That wasn't in my herb list. What is Panchagavya Gritam? 
Well, uh, it's five. Um, it's five substances that come from the cow. It's cow's milk mixed with cow's ghee, mixed with cow's yogurt, mixed with cow's urine, mixed with cow's feces. And you mix it all together and it's like the best. <laughs> and you're like, what, Dr. Scott, are you trying to get us to eat poop? <laughs> Is this a joke? <laughs> you are trying to get us to eat poop. <laughs> <laughs> can we use it in our practice <laughs> this formulation yeah you can use it in your practice getting a hold of it is is the challenge because really the only people selling it are in india i don't even know if it's available in india on ebay or not um but at indian pharmacies if you go to a, an ayurvedic pharmacy in india you can order up some pancha gavirkritam and you take a spoonful every morning if you have uh, 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 an intense brain disease and it, it heals you, uh, supposedly. And so we'll discuss some of these actually very powerful Ayurvedic formulations that maybe you aren't getting in your other courses uh, because some of the more powerful ones are made with Ayurvedic alchemy. And so Ayurvedic alchemy prepares mercury and sulfur, uh, alchemically speaking. So they, they, they wash them in ghee and milk and yogurt and urine and, and heat them up and so that they, uh, they actually oxidize. So you're not getting pure mercury, you're getting mercury oxide. You're not getting pure sulfur, you're getting sulfur oxide. But the body, for whatever reason, really likes mercury oxide and sulfur oxide when it's combined with medicines because it takes the medicine straight to the deep tissue, um, which is really cool. Um, so we'll look at, at some of those herbs, then we'll do a whole day on pranayama in the mind because really pranayama and knowing some pranayamas um, in your practice on how that will affect your mind. And then lastly, uh, we'll do some meditation and we may even do some case studies. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, so uh, this course would be introductory to Sat Vavajaya Chikitsa in Ayurveda, uh, psychotherapy maybe, or not. So what therapy? I didn't hear, I didn't understand. Uh, psychotherapy, Sat Vavajaya, I don't know. It's psychotherapy? Just... We'll look a little into Ayurveda. You know, psychotherapy implies to me that you're talking out your problems. Um, and, and I don't know that... I, and Ayurveda will do some of that, especially in their meditations. Uh, hold on one sec, my door is ringing again. Okay, sorry about that. Um, the door rang again. So um, psychotherapy, uh, Ayurveda doesn't really talk, have a system of like, oh, Tell me about your mother, um, you know, <laughs> but um, we do have uh, meditation techniques that say, oh, okay, you know, you're having an emotion about this. Let's watch that emotion. And then in learning deeper meditation, what we do is we'll say, okay, what's triggering your emotion? You know, what is the sanskara? And, and we have to know these words. What are, what are the sanskaras and, and vasanas that are making this emotion pop up? Um, so um, Ayurveda does have this whole theory that we have to get into. And once you develop clarity of mind, you can start to look at what's causing the emotions. Okay, because oftentimes what's causing the emotions is uh, something that happened years ago, not the, not the situation that's happening now. Um, for example, uh, you know, when I was younger, my dad used to get us donuts when we were a Sunday morning. And so I began to associate donuts with happiness and love and family. And so every time I see a donut now, it's like, oh, I want to eat this donut. Why do I want to eat this donut? I know donuts are bad to, for me. I took the basic Ayurveda class. I know I should not be eating donuts, right? And, but what's triggering it is 
an impression left in my mind from years ago that donuts are when you're happy <laughs> and donuts when you have family and donuts when you're surrounded by love. And so now I've made the false connection, donuts equals love, right? Actually donuts equal tummy ache, but I haven't made that connection, right? Donuts equal ring around the tummy um, and, and weight gain and, and feeling awful afterwards. But no, in my mind, I've associated donuts with love. And so I keep getting attracted and pulled back into eating the evil donut. And, but with meditation, you can say, why am I attracted to donut? And, and, and asking that question, the answer pops. And when the answer pops and you see it, it dissolves. And so this becomes one way of Ayurvedic uh, psychology, you might say, is that you dissolve these past impressions or you, you, you do what's called cleaning out the memory. In the Yoga Sutras, it's Smriti Parishuddhau. Like you have to clean the memory out now because all these old memories, uh, when they're still emotionally charged with false equivalencies and false connections, uh, they might be causing you obstacles for the state of yoga, if that makes sense. So there's not like, oh, when you approach a client, you have to ask this question and you have to have this. We, we don't have that um, as a science. We have that as... Um, almost unspoken methodologies that you might learn from your guru. How does your guru do it? <laughs> you know, how does your teacher do it? Um, and, and um, but Ayurveda does have remedies for more serious psychiatric problems. Like we'll use mantra um, for schizophrenia, right? And mantra for schizophrenia might be the best thing to do is the schizophrenia might be caused by an external force, not by an internal force. Um, and so mantra is the way to cure that, right? So Ayurveda will have these other techniques in treating psychiatric that, that might seem a little unconventional, or they might put a big cone on your head. You have this big cone head and you pour oil in the head and let it sit there. You're like what? But yeah, it's called Shura Basti. And Ayurveda might use that too. Okay, I'm rambling. I hope I answered your question because I see other questions. So I'm going to move on to that. Um, Patricia or Patricia. Is it Patricia or Patricia? Yes, Patricia. Thank you. Um, so I work with a lot of people who uh, have gone through a lot of uh, traumas, such as sexual traumas or generational traumas. I work mostly within the, the POC community, which is um, in people of color. And I, where are you located? I'm in New York. New York City? Yeah, I'm in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. In Brooklyn? Oh, I used to, I spent summers in Brooklyn uh, near the museum. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I live, I've lived fairly close to it right now, too. Oh, and, and Park yeah. Slope, there's my favorite restaurant called the, the V Spot. It was a vegan restaurant. I know exactly what you're talking about. Ooh. So good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Look at that. Oh, yeah. Go on. What's your question? So right now, one of the things that I'm really, all of these, the people that I do work with are very, very, very highly aware of themselves and under, and can understand that they have certain trigger, triggers. What we're trying to work on now is sort of dismantling those triggers and, or rather when they face these triggers or when these moments, they get triggered at some moments, how can they now work through it? Because Although these people can be extremely aware and they can at that moment understand that they may be reacting out of something that happened at the past, they still can't help but react. So would these practices and a lot of these things would be, that I'd be learning help? These absolutely, absolutely. In fact, there's a lot of Western science to back up mindfulness practice. Yeah. One of the effects of mindfulness practice is to create a witnessing awareness that allows right. you to act instead of react. Right. And so, and that's why when Ayurvedic psychology is applied, one of the best tools is both pranayama and meditation. Those are two of the best tools. Okay. That you learn pranayama and you learn meditation because both of those techniques, when you get used to doing them, will train the mind to act instead of react. Because when you start and practice witnessing awareness, okay, you, you learn like one of the famous, um, one of the best Buddhist meditations that's really good for psychology is to watch 
the um, to watch the emotions as they come up. And you practice and you watch your feelings and you watch your emotions and you and you you scan your body and because your body will hold on to emotions, you scan that and you watch it and you practice non-reactivity. And so one of the byproducts of mindfulness practices is non-reactiveness, which allows you then to act. So actually, sorry, can I piggybacking off of that? Because there is that level of, okay, I've done all of the mental work. I've done all of that. I have these. You haven't done all the, unless you're enlightened, you haven't right. done all of the mental work. <laughs> and I always, I tell a lot of the people I work with that there's always more work to do, yes. but there is uh, the body aspect of it all where our, our mind can become aware, but our body is still learning how to let go of these things. Will those be practices that we're also going to be learning? Or I guess you did well, I haven't, I haven't filled in the course yet. Okay, okay. <laughs> It's a month away. And so that, that's one of my projects for this month is to fill in all the details of the course. And if you want me, I, I can include a body scan practice to get the, one of the meditations. And really cool. If you sign up to the course, just remind me and I'll make sure to include it. But the body scanning is super great for cleaning the memory mm -hmm. through the body scan. Right, right. And as you put your awareness in the body. Like if you've ever gone to a massage and, and the person's massaging your back or your underneath your shoulder blade and all of a sudden you flash back to some random memory when you were seven right you're like what's that about why am i remembering when i was seven well what that's about is well memories and experiences are actually stored energetically in the somatic tissue of the body and when the body is, is manipulated or when awareness maybe it's not the manipulation but maybe it's your awareness when it goes into that part of the body, it then releases that stored uh, emotional energy. So yes, we'll do that, Patricia, absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay, Jessica, you have the next question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just have a quick question. I've been reading a lot about um, anxiety and depression and different ways to treat that. Uh -huh. And um, one of the big things that I've noticed is um, psilocybin and that treating depression. What is like, does, I mean, does Ayurveda have like a perspective on that? Yes, Ayurveda says that everything can be medicine and everything can be poison. Okay. Okay, so, so Ayurveda, even if, if in classical Indian canon and we pick up the Ayurvedic textbooks and psilocybin isn't being used, okay? Ayurveda still says everything has qualities everything has properties, everything has cause and effect, right? Every, every herb will have a rasa, virya, and a vipak, and a prabhav, right? And these, yeah. these are things we can talk about okay. um, when cool. discussing herbs. But anyway, so does psilocybin work? Well, if it's not been studied before and it's new, Ayurveda can approach it and say, well, let's look at it and let's look at the data and let's look at its qualities and let's hold it energetically and feel its properties because ultimately that's how we learned how medicines work. Okay, so there was a shamanistic kind of beginnings to Ayurveda where you would actually just hold the, the herb or hold the root or hold the leaf and you'd feel what it'd be doing to your own body energetically and you'd know how to use it. Um, right, and I guess like the, the, idea, the idea of like um, taking it kind of under guidance and, and reaching enlight enlightenment um, quicker, like quicker quote unquote, than going through all of these meditation practices to eventually get there. Like that's what I've been reading about too. Yeah, so do you get enlightened faster if you use psilocybin? Is that your question? <laughs> I guess so. Or like, is it? I, I don't know if you get enlightened faster. Uh, what I do know is having, you know, held uh, the mushroom and felt its quality, one of the qualities of psilocybin is tamogun. Okay. It's tamas. And what I do know about getting enlightenment is that you need less tamas. Mm -hmm. um, so I suspect while some out, yoga sutras chapter four, verse one does say that aushadi, which is medicines, okay, certain medicines can speed you forward towards enlightenment. Uh, I don't know if psilocybin is one of them. 
okay. I think that it definitely gives you an experience of connectivity. It gives you a glimpse into spirit, but it's not going to be a like if you if you just you know eat mushrooms all day long and you know wow I'm in light like and I've known people like this who are who are drug addicts and uh, you know they'll take even do you know DMT yeah you know, they'll just DMT I see God. I see God as they're, you know, drooling in the corner of a parking lot, right. uh, losing everything they own, um, quite literally. And, yes. you know, maybe the, it gives you a brief spiritual experience, but the, the whole effect is tamas, which is heaviness and inertia and dullness. And, and while it opens those gates briefly, uh, to keep them open, you have to you have to do the work and build sattva. So that can be a useful, hey, this is what's out there. This is what's coming. But as a sustained practical tool for enlightenment, I don't think psilocybin's the way. Uh, oh, it's just yeah. too tomsic. Uh, and it makes the mind tomsic. It makes the people who, who uh, like I'm just thinking DMT, the conclusions of people you know, while they have this experience and they're like, oh, we're all connected, we're all one, yay. Okay, you've got, you, you've seen it now, but also like, you know, they also have crazy other conclusions that aren't right, uh, that can come out of it uh, because it, it, it is a Tomsic item. Um, you know, I did try psilocybin once and I was hiking in the forest and, and that's how I know it's heavy, heavy, heavy. And Tomsic. Can you call Ambika? She was calling me. What happened? Anupam? Okay. I think she's looking for you. Okay. Um, the heaviness is interesting, though, because I feel like, um, like it's not necessarily Western medicine that says it's the opposite, because I don't think Western medicine even really believes in it yet. Um, yeah. But, but the the things that I've read and I I can't speak from experience, but it, did, it did kind you of read Michael Pollan's book yet? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's and, kind of yeah, what there's, there's some good research, and if what it does is it changes your cognitive awareness, uh, right. and it changes your cognitive, and you use it for a little bit to change your cognitive awareness, to realize your connectivity, to realize that what was causing your depression isn't, you know, using that. It, the prabhav, the special power of the psilocybin, even though it's tamsic, to help with depression, if, if it works there, use it. Absolutely. That's what Ayurveda is going to say. Yeah. Just realize its qualities. It's going to be tamsic, and you're going to want to go to Burger King and eat a, a huge impossible burger and french fries and milkshake afterwards. <laughs> you know, it, that's what happens. Uh, but if it works to, to you know spur them out of the depression, sure. It's right. just like surgery. Surgery is invasive. Right, you cut a person open, and there's a huge scar, and blood goes everywhere. Right, it's very damaging to the body. But when do we use it? We use it when we need it. Right, yeah. we need surgery to cure a bigger problem. And so that's what psilocybin is. It's it's this like surgery kind of thing. If you want to use it to cure a bigger problem, great. But you can't use it with people who are using or addicted to other drugs. Right. Because if they're addicted to other drugs, this is just another addiction that they're going to get into. Hmm. And, and they're going to be addicted to the inner TV of spiritual psilocybin, right? Oh, I get to, you know, I'm, I'm going to get to watch TV again. Right. Um, and, and they're going to miss the point. Um, and that's, that's along the way of enlightenment. That's one of the pitfalls traditionally is watch out for getting caught in inner TV because you, when you start to wake up the mind, you, you start to wake up this particular chakra, you start to see things. And, and you're like, oh, I saw something. I want to see it again. I want to see it again. It's just like turning on the TV and watching The Mandalorian. I want to watch it again. I want baby Yoda, right? <laughs> it's, it, that's external TV and this is internal TV. And what can happen is when internal TV turns on, people can get addicted to it and want it more and more. And that's a pitfall. Mm -hmm. And so you definitely want to avoid the inner TV. And that's what can happen with psilocybin is people who use it are like, I want that experience again. I want that experience again. And they get addicted to it. And, and in fact, it just keeps making them heavier and heavier and heavier and less able to function in, in this world, which then becomes a problem, dharmically speaking, 
is once you, you, you take too many drugs, you can't function in, in, in ordinary reality anymore. And then you can't support your family and then you can't support, you know, you can't keep your job, like there are problems. Yeah. And, and you don't want to have those problems. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting concept to me. So um, great. yeah, thank you. No problem. Okay, uh, Sonia, question. Um, I kind of got a little confused after you were saying that it is like mushrooms or like drugs are like tomasic. Yes, absolutely. When, tomasic. Like, how does that relate to like when we're talking about like Vata stuff? Because I remember in the text that in like one of the nutrition um, courses that it was saying that like, I'm, I just looked it up, that alcohol and marijuana and like LSD and, and what I would consider like mushrooms, like hallucinogens of mushrooms um, as like an ether thing. Like how does that relate, I guess, in a uh, domestic way when you're saying it's like heaviness? I, I, it's, it's toxic because that's its effect on the body. Right. Right. It's, so is that different than like, like a different aspect that's not an ether no, you're, you're, quality? You're, you're using two different aspects of the same paradigm, really. Okay. So in Sankhya philosophy, there's Sattva Rajas Tamas. Everything is Sattva Rajas Tamas. Everything, and, and what you take into yourself, the qualities of that Sattva Rajas Tamas are going to be part of the qualities of your mind, ultimately. Okay. So that being said, anything that comes into material being also, okay, it has Sattva Rajas Tamas and it has more or less of one of the five elements. Okay, that, that makes more sense. Okay, so it also has five elements. Okay, cool. I and, just kind and, of can- Yeah, can and, and its ether quality probably does when we look at Ayurveda and if we do Ayurveda from an elemental perspective, mm -hmm. you know, it, yes, its ether quality will probably disturb Vata. Okay. But like not create a heaviness within your, is that like how it materializes in your mind as like, even though it's a Vata ether quality, it creates a heaviness in your mind. Like I'm just trying to like relate yeah, to that. It's, it's after effect is very heavy. Like you might not feel, well, actually it's during effect is heavy too. Psilocybin. Okay. I, I remember hiking because I just tried it once. I wanted to see what it was, what was this all about? And yeah, I mean, there's uh, definitely like a heaviness to that and like maybe like other drugs. And so my experience yeah. is it, I was hiking and I didn't want to hike. I wanted to curl up into a ball under that tree. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that anything that does that to you is tomsic. It's heavy. Right. If that, if that has that quality, it's, it's a heavy quality. Um, mm -hmm. And um. And yes, it gave me some ether quality as well. I was aware that the forest wanted to eat me, right? Uh, and, and, and that's true. The forest does want to eat you because it, not, not in a bad or vicious way, but what the forest is, is a big digestion pit of life. Life gets recycled and turned over and, and digested in this forest. Um, and so you can get ether-like insights uh, from it, but you also, it's, it's tomsic, like it's heavy. Like as Tomsic as like heaviness, it sounds like it's like a bad thing. Well, it's, well, Ayurveda says there are two doshas of the mind, mm -hmm. Rajas and Tamas. So the more Tamas you put in your mind, well, that's gonna, that's gonna distract your mind from being more sattvic because the, the mind when it's functioning optimally is sattvic. And so you want your mind to be sattvic. Okay, and so there are times where you might want tamas. Okay, if your mind is racing and racing and racing and it won't slow down, you want that heaviness to kind of slow it down, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why people will have a drink at night. Oh, I had so much, I'm out of, I was going crazy at work and crazy at work. Oh, I can settle down. And the tamas on the mind helps combat the rajas. 
right? And then there are times where you want rajas to combat the tamas, but ultimately you want to cultivate more and more and more sattva and have less and less and less tamas. Okay, I mean, you can ultimately have too much sattva and that's when people get really ungrounded, but that's another discussion. Generally speaking, you want to cultivate sattva in the mind. Okay, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does, thank you. Great. Uh, Patricia, again, you guys have such good questions. <laughs> I actually just wanted to piggyback on that one a little bit because um, for example, like when you smoke weed, you get high, you know what I mean? So like you, I would have thought that it was the opposite of it. And uh, one of my, the, the people, uh, the girls that I'm working with right now, we actually went to do ayahuasca a couple years ago in Peru. And what it did for her was um, it actually made her, it, it did awaken her in many ways. But I think it then disturbed her and it made her extremely anxious where now her thoughts seemed very unclear. Mm. Were, were always very unclear, but she was so hyperactive, but cloudy. And now she's just constantly going back and like, oh, I need to try this because I need this. I just feel like I need this again just to cleanse myself. So what I'm doing with her is actually working on, a, on something to help ground her. But because like you said, it is more tamastic Am I not doing that? Like, should I not be grounding her? I, well, do you know grounding doesn't necessarily mean tamas. Okay, right. Right, okay. Grounding might just mean awakening the lower chakras and getting right. the person's awareness to kind of anchor into those lower chakras. That, that might be grounding. Mm -hmm. um, whereas tamas might, tamas when we're talking about the mind is a heaviness of mind. Mm -hmm. Okay, where, where the person no longer thinks clearly and the person is delusional or has just wrong thoughts that don't reflect. When tamas is in the mind, it creates a mind state called mudha. Mudha. And we get the English word muddled, actually from I think that same Sanskrit root, mudha. And it means you're just confused. You have wrong thoughts. Your, your definition of reality is just wrong and, and you're just delusional. And you know, if you've ever worked with like re recovering meth addicts or something, like they, they actually have created whole paranoid delusions out of the tamas from that particular drug, um, which are, you know, scary sometimes because the, the mind is so delusional and even pot does it to a certain extent, wrong thoughts or wrong or inability to process. Uh, like one of the things I've done is I've, I've taught some adult learners how, how to read and, you know, one of the adult learners came you know, showed up to class one time and they were stoned. And it was like they had, their progress went back six months. Like they couldn't, <laughs> everything they had learned, they had forgotten because of the tamas quality of pot. You know, it really does affect, it gives a heaviness to the mind that affects, you know, cognition. Could it be possible to ha like have a rajistic and tamastic mind? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's your mind can be uh, rajasic and tamasic at the same time. Well, usually you're going back and forth between them. Okay. Okay. You're, you're okay. I'm thinking tamasic, 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 and now I'm going to go for a run, and I have to work a 12-hour day, and now I'm going to go do drugs and calm down and. You know, you can go back and forth between those states. Uh, and, and we'll go over that when we hit the yoga philosophy section. But yeah, um, I, so I'm not, yeah. And if you use drugs, I'm not saying that they're all bad. They, they, they have prabhav. There are qualities to them that may be useful. Uh, and Ayurveda actually does use bhanga. You'll see bhanga as an ingredient to some of the old formulations because it is useful. Uh, in certain contexts. Like I already says, everything is medicine and everything is poison. It just depends on the person. And do you want to give that particular item to that person? Is that going to be useful and helpful? Or is it going to be not useful and not helpful? Is it going to make the problem worse? Or is it going to make the problem better? You know, and, and for, uh, for someone who's in a lot of, for example, a lot of pain or, or uh, I've been told, there's a lot of good research about cancer patients who use high doses of THC uh, and it cures stage four cancers. Um, 
and you can investigate that research out of Israel because the Israelis are doing that kind of cancer research. No one else is because, oh, it's pot, right? Um, but they've discovered that, uh, or at least I think the reports I've been seeing have been that, um, you know, high doses of THC are very useful for cancer recovery. Amazing. Okay, so use it there. Uh, but the, the person who, who uses it and and then loses all motivation to work and then, you know, starts getting wrong thoughts about everything and then, you know, starts blaming other people for their problems. You know, that's, that's no good. That, you know, that person is not raising their awareness in any useful way. They're, they're focusing on a crutch, which allows them to escape reality. And that's Thomas. Okay, Jessica has a question. Oh, did I answer your question, Patricia? You did, but now I have so many more. Okay, okay. <laughs> write, write one down, and after Jessica, you can you can go next. Yeah. So my question, um, kind of vague and like probably a basic question, but for someone who is um, like dealing with a lot of stress, anxiety, sadness, but is extremely closed off and like doesn't open up to anyone what would be like the first step to helping someone like that? Like, how do you kind of like, are there, it, what would be like the first way to kind of like peel that first layer? Well, they have to ask for help. They and if they don't- Go up and say, hi, I'm going to help you now. <laughs> I have Ayurveda, <laughs> right? Jazz hands. Um, as an Ayurvedic practitioner, one of the things as an Ayurvedic practitioner, I'm not saying as a mother or as a sister or as a brother, like that's different. Yeah. Uh, but as an Ayurvedic practitioner, you cannot go helping people who don't seek you out. Right. Okay. That's against the rules. And, and we all make that mistake at first. I did the same thing. I know Ayurveda. Let me tell everyone not to drink ice water. You know what happens if you start telling everyone not to drink ice water? Or they, they don't invite you to lunch anymore. And that's what happens. Um, so they have to, you have to contain the information, everything you get, you have to contain until such time as they say, will you help me? You can offer, hey, I know something. If you want, I can share it with you. But if they don't come to you for help, you cannot help them. That's against the rules. And so what if it is like a personal so if it's a personal thing, then that's, that's a completely different thing. Okay, so you have a, a sister who won't talk to you and won't seek help. Well, then you do a family intervention and, and, and you switch paradigms. You're no longer Ayurvedic practitioner. You're now sister. You're now brother. You're now mother. You're not, and, and you do what, whatever it takes to help that person, right? Um, oftentimes, and it depends on what the cause is. And I don't know this person. I don't know what the cause is. But, you know, getting them connected with a social support network is usually a first step because people who think they're alone, you know, and then don't interact with other people, it, it just, it's a downward spiral uh, and ultimately, you know, not very good. Uh, but getting them to open up and usually pouring love on them is a good first step. Yeah. Um, you know, find out how they how they receive love, whether it's through words or through gifts or through um, actions of service or, or you know, whatever it is. Make them feel loved, and and that will be the first step towards healing, um, because that feeling of love often opens up and lowers the defenses. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. All right. Okay. Yes, Payam. Uh, uh, you, uh, you spoke about um, some materialistic views about uh, some psychology and our soul, mind, and something uh, else. Uh, I read on the Bhagavad Gita about Mayavadis. Uh, do you mean, uh, did you mean Mayavadis, actually Indian uh, ancient materialistic materialists or uh, just you talked about the materialistic as the general aspect. I, my, what is the word Mayavati? Mayavadis. Uh, Mayavadis uh, mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita uh, about something, uh, some, the, some group of the uh, philosophies 
uh, just uh, don't believe it about so can you type that out i don't know what the word is can you type it in the chat box uh, yeah 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 uh, sure uh, actually i read it on the um para yeah buddy Prabhupada a translation of Bhagavad Gita. I, I read it. You know, I, I don't yes. know the translation. I don't I, I'm not a Gita expert. I know some Gita, but I'm not like the Gita expert. Oh um, uh, hi, this is Alka. Uh, could it possibly be uh, a word, uh, another way to say it might be Marjadi? M-A-R-J-A-D-I. Marjadi? Uh, I, again, I'm I'm not sure what we're talking about. This? It's something that uh, a particular religion in India uh, and people who are followers of Gita, they do that to kind of renounce using certain things, taking, uh, taking, I'm not too clear, but from what I know from my relatives is that they cook for themselves, they clean for themselves, and uh, even if they are sick, they typically don't use anybody else's services like that. Ah. So they have limited use of certain things. Okay. Yeah, I don't know anything about that. So I okay. Know. I yeah, I don't know about uh, the other word, but I thought maybe it kind of sounded a little similar. So I just is wanted that, to speak up. Is that what you were thinking about, Payam, or is this something else? Uh, uh, no, that was just this. this. Uh, actually, I, I'd like to know um, our course uh, will be more about a uh, philosophical point, point of view. Uh, or something about more about uh, meditation or yeah, so uh, yes, something yes. like this. For the first four weeks we'll do philosophy, then we'll do a little a application exercise, uh, and then we'll do some herbs, and then we'll do some pranayama, and then we'll do some meditation, and we may even do some case studies that I'll present about how uh, how I've seen people treated uh, for mental illness in Ayurveda. Thank you. So, um, yeah, Melita, I, I'm just looking at the chat box. I'm sorry, I didn't see it earlier. Uh, purging, I don't know if psilocybin purges tamasic energy, um, but it, it, it might purge other things. Like it might help trigger the person out of the depression. Um, I, I don't know if we call it purge, because its quality is toms, it, tamasic gunas. It's... it's um, I don't know. I just, I don't know if I'd phrase it that way is all I'm saying. Um, okay, other questions? Sorry, I have a quick question about the course itself. So um, the first woman who spoke, she said, um, do we have to take it if we've already taken a different course? Like what, what does this overlap with another course or is I, it? Like I have no idea. I'm not familiar enough with the Yoga Veda curriculum to know what's being okay. in the other courses. Okay. Uh, but your administrators might know because they might have a more top down level idea okay. of what's in the courses. Thank you. I believe she's, because I have mentioned something about the Yoga Sutra course that you did. I was wondering if the Yoga Philosophy course that you're doing, if that was the same. No, well, we're, we're going to do a yoga day together uh, with the Ayurveda and the Mind course, but the yoga philosophy will be six days of yoga philosophy. So it'll be much more in-depth and much more uh, information than just uh, what we'll do together uh, in the yoga chitta and the chitta vichara class. And so if you're wondering what everyone's asking about, um, I'll just briefly take a moment for shameless advertising. Um, here, I'll share my screen. Um, just a yoga philosophy. I am doing a yoga philosophy 101 with the Yoga Sutras. It's starting this Friday at noon Pacific time, six one hour sessions. Um, if you're interested, we're going to do yoga sutras and we'll chant the sutras and like, it'll be way more in depth than then what we'll we'll just do an overview in the in the Chitta Vichara class, but this will go in depth where we'll be digging and digging in Sanskrit and whatnot. Um, but there is a little overlap, just to let you know. Um, so, but if you're interested in that, uh, go to my website teacherscott.org and you can read more about it there. Okay, enough shameless advertising. Uh, 
other questions? No other questions. Sonia has a question. Um, with the things that you will be talking about um, in your class, <clears throat> I appreciate like the theories that we talk about in a lot of classes. Um, but would there be like more specific situations, like on a broad scale and like in a specific way? Because I, in my like small lifetime, um, have experienced or come across a lot of people with depression. Um, my my stepdad um, struggles with bipolar and is like in and out of the hospital a lot. Um, and it's like I talked to him today for like a, a while and it's sometimes difficult kind of watching the thought process that someone goes through and like how to be supportive without like, like you were saying, without like suggesting things when they haven't asked or anything and just being like supportive when you're, when you're seeing the, the like tells that people are kind of being too like in their head, I guess. Yeah, so I don't know. It, always the question <laughs> is what's the cause, right? It's yeah. always what's the cause, what's the cause, what's the cause? And as Ayurvedic practitioners, we have several, the reason we're doing many different paradigms and philosophies is to get you used to um, the idea that in the Eastern mind, we have multiple paradigms so that we can look at things in different ways to try to see, well, how is the cause manifesting? You know, is the cause diet? Did, did this person, you know, get their, their chemistry off, their brain chemistry off balance because of diet? Was it drug use? Did they get their brain chemistry off, off because they used too much meth? You know, is it spirit possession? Is that the cause? You know, were they having sex under a tree and a spirit jumped in in the middle? Was it, um, you know, is the cause that uh, past life karma? Um, and, and that's why, you, you know, it's helpful to know Vedic astrology to be able to ascertain, oh, that's what's going on. It's actually a very subtle past life karma. And if you, once you ascertain the cause, then you can more closely go after the treatment. Well, if the cause was food, we alter the diet. If the cause was meth, you take the meth away. If the cause was spirit possession, well, you get someone in a shaman type to, to handle it, or you have the person start doing mantras and bringing deity energy into themselves, and that deity energy will push the, the possessing entity out. Is the cause, um, you know, material in the sense that, oh, they have had such bad habits that they've, um, lost their social network or their social support network is the cause wrong eating lifestyle like they're they're eating ice cream all day and that's yeah you know is the cause I, you know situations at work so you have to really go find the cause and once you find the cause then you can start to look for a treatment avenue and and no matter what we'll learn some ayurvedic herbs to help people with different disorders and in in looking at those uh, you know, even if you don't know the cause or can't figure out the cause right away, you can at least give the herbs to help, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Did I answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, Patricia, another question. Oh, thank you guys, this has been such a fun day. I'm glad we got to do this. I hope this was nice and useful and helpful for all of you. Yeah, this is super, super interesting now. Um, well, one, one question. Um, w would you help us find ways on determining what are the factors that got the person to that point? But yeah, you have seven years to study astrology and... <laughs> a lot, right? Yeah. <laughs> and but another question... Do, yes, I will. What we do is one drop at a time Vedic tradition like we just keep adding what little we can and 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 what what really we do is this is our instrument 
uh, for Western scientists, their instrument is, you know, they have the, what's the thing called with the, the, the earpiece, uh, the, the stethoscope, right? They have the stethoscope and they have the microscope and all these scopes, right? What do we have in, in Ayurveda? Well, we have our five senses, but not just our five gross senses. We also have our five subtle senses. And so one of the things we do is we eat a vegetarian diet and we do regular fasting and we practice silence and we do meditation and we do pranayama and, and, and we do all these things to cultivate sattva in our own minds so that our intuition is developed. Ha ha! Right? We develop our own, our own intuition so that when we grab someone's pulse and take their pulse, okay, and our energy is linked for a second, in that second, we might get a flash of intuition to know what the cause is. And the most famous example I like to talk about is uh, with my teacher, Dr. Ladd. Um, you know, he, he took someone's pulse and this person was having headaches and no one, she'd been to every Western doctor under the sun couldn't figure out why she was having headaches. And, you know, I apologize if you've heard this story before. And he looks up at her and says, hey, um, you have a tree in your backyard? She says, what? Yeah, why? She says, and he says, have you been throwing dirty dishwater on the tree in your backyard? And she says, yes, why? <laughs> what does this have to do with anything? And he says, well, there's a spirit living in that tree and the tree really doesn't like dirty dishwater. And so the spirit's attacking and giving you these headaches. <laughs> and she says, oh. So he says, look, go out, give the tree fresh, clean water and light incense to the tree. Her headaches were gone in a couple of days. How did that happen? Well, he cultivated his intuition and you know, he's also a tantric. And so he, he learns to work with spirits. That's what tantrics do. And so maybe he saw the spirit there or he saw a flash. I don't know what he saw. I do know one other time um, I was in India traveling about, not as dramatic, but um, when I was studying in, with him the first time in India, um, there are these things in India called the sweet lassi. Do you guys know what a lassi is? It's a yogurt drink. It's, oh, it's amazing. It's like the yummiest thing ever. And I'm a pitta kapha guy. And so there's a lot of kapha in the system already and so i see this thing called the sweet lassi and it's you know it's when i'm a student and everything's cheap in india it's only a quarter for a sweet lassi oh, i'm gonna have one of these with every meal this is fantastic right so i was just downing these yogurt milkshakes um and within like three or four days i became a mucus monster i had mucus from every orifice of my body i was just sneezing it up and out uh, i was disgusting and, um, and, and trying to study from Dr. Lod. And he said, you need treatment. And he sat me down where, where everyone gets treatment. And he says, why are you sick? Because as an Ayurvedic practitioner, you're supposed to know cause and effect. What did you do wrong? What was your pragnaparada? You guys know that word pragnaparada? It's a mistake of the intellect where you did something wrong to hurt your body's physiology. And, and I said, you know, I did what every good uh, student with a, with a smart guru does in the face of a question from the guru. I lied. And I said, oh, Dr. Lod, it must be the pollution. <laughs> so he took my pulse and he said, hmm, you've been eating too many sweet things, <laughs> right? So he was able to get the cause from this flash of intuition is my point. And so, and he's someone who does ritual and does mantras and upasanas and, and all these things to make his intuition function. And, and, you know, it's on us if we want to be really good Ayurvedic practitioners. That's what we have to do. We have to cultivate our own mind with sattva, right? Most, most of these guys don't drink alcohol ever. Right? You see a good Ayurvedic practitioner, you see a good guru, they don't drink. They don't, you know, the good gurus I've met, the ones that are got there, they don't do pot, they don't do LSD. You know, if I want to model myself off, these people cultivate sattva, you know, and, and they do it without putting tomsic things into their body so that they can have those flashes of intuition to help the people that are around them. 
Okay. And does that answer your question? <laughs> I, I don't remember the question anymore. I just kept talking. No, it, it is. And it's actually more motivating than anything else. So I appreciate that. I did have one more, um, I guess, question. Um, have you ever heard of Dr. Joe Dispenza? No, I don't know who that is. Who is okay. That? Well, he's basically like a really dope modern doctor who is kind of like really, uh, how would I say? It? He's like all of the, like, the meditation and pranayamas and stuff that we do now, he's been able to sort of back it up by quantum physics and um, epigenetics now, which is pretty cool. So I actually just wanted to see what your thoughts were on that because uh, how he's been able to describe it is that through these practices such as asanas, meditations, mantras, um, mindful, all these other mindful type of exercises, you create new neural trans, uh, neural pathways. Would you say in your thoughts that's uh, what the goal kind of is on like a physical level? I don't know if I'm making, I'm, I don't, I'm not even sure yeah, what the so question I'm trying to What's your goal? <laughs> what, what was that? What, well, what's the goal? Is the goal enlightenment? <laughs> or is the goal that I want to be able to run a marathon? Or is the goal that, you know, I want to feel good in my body? Or is the goal, right. like, what's, what goal are we talking about? And, and, and that's the bigger question. So what goal are you talking about? And I'll tell you the best way to get there because there are different paths that the, the the Sanskrit word sadhya is goal. Mm -hmm. The Sanskrit word sadhana, sadhana, is means the path to the goal. Mm -hmm. So you have to be clear about what your sadhya is, what your goal is, and then you pick the best path. Okay. Right? Because with different goals, you're gonna have different paths. Mm -hmm. You know, is is weightlifting gonna get me enlightened? You know, probably not. Um, but is weightlifting gonna help me? lift things probably <laughs> if it's my goal to lift heavier objects then weightlifting is a really good path you know if it's my goal to, to you know to look mm, mm, to look good and besides that's what i want i want to have a sculpted physique then yeah weightlifting might be a good path there are other paths too mm. uh, but weightlifting is a good one and and so you have to evaluate the path depending upon what your goal is Okay. His, 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 uh, philosophy, I guess, is more of like whatever practice you do do, um, like you said, depending on your goal, oh, doing such things that like yoga and Ayurveda has to offer does create new neural pathways to yeah, help so, you achieve so those goals. If your goal is, you know, to, to enlightenment or the, or you want the yoga state of mind, we'll call it the yoga state of mind. Right, the goal of yoga is to change your mind, quite literally. Okay, then these practices, okay, indeed rewrite the software of the mind because that's really the goal of yoga is to rewrite the software of the mind to where it's working right. It, it's creating an optimal software package and, and creating optimal background algorithms for your mind. That's what yoga does, it rewrites. The, your software and and that's what this guy is doing he's saying yeah mindfulness rewrites the software well yeah that's what we're doing in yoga too or, or and that's probably what we're doing in these other systems of philosophy too your goal is they're all very mind focused and the goal is to rewrite you know the software package in the mind to where it's working right again because when it's working wrong we have we get stuck in bad thoughts or wrong thoughts or, or delusional thoughts and, and, uh, and, and we can't be in the present or we just get stuck in thoughts and we can't be in the present moment enjoying ourselves because that's why we're supposed to be here. We're supposed to be here in the present moment enjoying ourselves because we you know it's a great place to be. Okay, um, any, other, any other wrap up questions? Well, great, you guys. Um, do sign up for the Yoga Chitta, Vichara, uh, the Chitta Vichara class uh, that's coming. Um, and we'll get into more depth about that. And, and if you want a, a six-week course on Yoga Sutras, I'll have one of those starting on Friday. Just go to my website for that. Um, 
And um, what else? That's it. Well, it was a pleasure to see all of you, uh, especially some of my old friends. And um, we'll see you guys next time. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you.